Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mario Pinto, Vice President of Research International, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the University of Manitoba for the three-minute thesis competition final. Right? Let me begin by acknowledging the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we de dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. On a personal note, let me pay my respects to the elders, past and present, and I extend that respect to all indigenous peoples. As today's participants will demonstrate, it is important for us to recognize that there are many ways of knowing, learning, and sharing of knowledge. The three-minute thesis, or 3MT, is a research competition, but it's a communication competition. For graduate students, where participants must present their research and its wider impact in three minutes or less to a panel of non-specialist judges. Just bear with me here. I think one of the most challenging things a researcher can do is to condense months of literature searches, results of experiments, observations, detailed analyses for someone outside their field of expertise. Communica communicating complex ideas can be difficult, but it is among the most important aspects of creating impact with our research, which will be the, form the foundation of our new strategic research plan. And why is that? It's because effective dissemination is key to knowledge mobilization and translation for societal and economic impact. Over the past 11 years, this competition has grown to become a highlight of our winter term and an important opportunity to engage firsthand with the groundbreaking research of our graduate students. The University of Manitoba currently has more than 4,500 grad students, and they are principal contributors to our research enterprise. And in collaboration with their expert supervisors, they push the boundaries of knowledge and grow our international reputation. They are the lifeblood of the research enterprise. The students you will hear from today are our future business leaders, community activists, decision makers, and government policy makers. Their ideas will expand access to healthcare as a human right, inform action on climate action, climate change, pardon me, and provide pathways for indigenous reconciliation. And they will be charged with some of the most challenging problems in an ever-changing geopolitical context. I would like to thank each graduate student from the initial entrance to today's finalists for the time and effort they have invested to prepare for this competition. The passion and belief in your work will ensure that the University of Manitoba re remains innovative and competitive as one of Canada's leading research universities for generations to come. So best of luck to our finalists, the exciting and diverse range of presentations has provided our judges with a very difficult task as they prepare to select tonight's winners. So I would like to take this moment to thank all the judges for making this event a success. So please join me in giving the judges a hand. And thank you all to the three empty organizing committee led by Dr. Kelly Main, Acting Dean of Graduate Studies. Well done to all of your team. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's MC, Colleen Brady, whom you know very well as the weather specialist for CTV News at noon, five, and six, and she hosts the entertainment segment Spotlight. Born and raised in Winnipeg, Colleen is an alumna and holds a Bachelor 
of Arts Advanced Degree with a major in Political Studies from the University of Manitoba. Colleen started her career in broadcast journalism at 680C Job in 2005 and has been with CTV Winnipeg since 2011. Throughout her career, she has covered a wide range of topics from politics, crime, and courts, to health and human interest stories for radio and television. This is the second year that we have been fortunate to have Colin as a host of the 3MT final, and we are very happy to have her back with us. So please join me in welcoming Colin Brady. Yeah. Okay. And I've already broken my mask, so there we go. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Pinto, and thank you. I didn't uh, anticipate the long bio, but there you have a little bit about me now. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here again as the MC for the University of Manitoba's 11th annual three-minute thesis competition. As Dr. Pinto mentioned, this is my second time MCing, but my first time in person. Uh, now, as a, a proud graduate of the University of Manitoba, it's always a pleasure for me to stay connected to this community. And it's also exciting for me to be back on campus and see how much our school has grown and changed. In fact, the last time I was on campus, this theater wasn't even here yet. So it's exciting to, uh, to be back for tonight's competition. Thank you to all of you who are joining us here on campus, as well as to those who are joining us online this evening. The Three Minute Thesis, or 3MT, or 3MT rather, is an annual competition where graduate students from across the university compete in front of a non-specialist audience and a panel of judges. They must explain their research thesis in plain language in three minutes or less. Not an easy task. The 3MT model was developed by the University of Queensland, Australia, and today competitions are held in over 85 countries and nearly 1,000 schools right around the world. The 3MT competition at the University of Manitoba began earlier this year. 36 individuals were selected from an initial pool of talented masters and doctoral students uh, who then competed in one of three heats. Now this process determined the finalists who will compete tonight. Tonight's event is the culmination of months of hard work by the 12 student finalists. They have put so much time and effort into preparing engaging presentations. Now this competition you'll find is going to be fast paced, exciting, and I for one am ready to get started. Tonight the finalists are competing for the following. The People's Choice Award, third place, the University of Manitoba Retirees Association Prize for second place, and of course the Dr. Archie McNichol Prize for first place. The graduate student who takes home first place tonight will represent the University of Manitoba at the Western Canadian Regional Competition in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan and have a chance to compete in Canada's national 3MT competition. Now the rules, of course there are rules. The rules for this competition are as follows. Each finalist is allowed one slide to support their presentation. Their presentation must be three minutes or less, not a second longer, or they will be disqualified. No pressure there. The finalists will be judged on comprehension, content, engagement, and communication. Now, while presenting, the students will have a monitor facing them with a countdown clock so they know exactly how much time they have left. Following the presentations, the judges uh, will head off to a private room to deliberate. At this time, a link will appear on screens for menti.com. This free platform will allow you to cast your vote for the People's Choice Award. I'll give you instructions on how to use Menti after all the students have presented. Now, while the judges deliberate, uh, there will be a small reception in the Galleria just outside of the theater, and you are all invited to attend. I would now like to introduce our judges for the event. Anita Warsman is president of the Asper Foundation, a Winnipeg-based philanthropic organization. She is a two-time UM alum uh, with degrees from the Asper School of Business and the Faculty of Law. A wave, Anita. Hi. <laughs> Destiny Seymour, founder of Indigo Arrows, an indigenous-led home goods line. She is a UM alum with a degree from the Faculty of Architecture. And finally, James Schellenberg, founder and CEO of Cubreza, world leader in brain imaging. He is a three-time UM alum with degrees from the Price Faculty of Engineering. Thank you all for making the time to be with us tonight, and good luck choosing your favorites. You have a tough job ahead of you. 
We are, of course, also live streaming tonight's event, so please be aware that any comments you might make just might be audible on the recording. Just saying, just letting you know. We also ask that uh, you kindly be as quiet as you're able uh, during the presentations and hold off clapping until after the presenter has finished speaking. Now, for the same reason, as you might expect, we'll now ask that you turn off your cell phones or at least turn them to silent if you wouldn't mind. Now, if you do need to leave the room for any reason, please exit at the top of the room to the side stairs and re-enter that way also. Volunteers will be stationed at the doors to ensure they're opened and closed quietly. Now, as for these doors behind me on the left and right, they can't be used to exit or re-enter the room unless, of course, there is an emergency. For those who want to join the online conversation, the event hashtags this evening are hashtag 3MT, hashtag UManitoba, and hashtag UMResearch. And with all that said, let's get to the competition. Our first finalist this evening is Rashmita Chatterjee. Rashmita completed her Bachelor of Science degree from the National Institute of Technology in India. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Manitoba with her advisor, Dr. Zara Musavi. Her thesis title is Strengthening the Brain's Internal GPS as a Means to Battle Alzheimer's. Would you be able to get back home from an unknown place without using GPS? Most probably not, right? But from your local grocery store? Definitely. For people living with Alzheimer's, getting back home from the grocery store is also a challenge. This is because Alzheimer's affects the internal GPS of the brain, leading to forgetting familiar routes and getting lost. Over 500,000 people in Canada alone are living with Alzheimer's, and there is currently no cure for the disease. Hence, even a treatment that will make them more confident in navigating their neighborhood will play a significant role in keeping Alzheimer's at bay for longer. I anticipate playing a navigation treasure hunt game for 30 minutes regularly for four weeks will help strengthen this internal GPS and uh, will help strengthen their internal GP, GP, uh, and, uh, and improve their navigation. Influence of uh, expectation of a reward also influences this navigation, and confidence of getting the reward improves navigation. This is why I designed a treasure hunt game. When people living with Alzheimer's play the game, even if they make mistakes, when they finally find the treasure box, they're always super proud of themselves. And this regular dose of positivity will help strengthen their internal GPS. However, if they do not find the game motivating, they will not want to play it regularly, which would defeat the purpose of the game. Hence, I'm also studying their motivation to play. Some reasons that can act as motivation are feeling the game is beneficial for them or because they're enjoying it. In this context, using a gaming controller for player movement was a good idea. It was easy to use, and they enjoyed it. 10 older adults living with Alzheimer's have played my game till date. Eight of them had not used a gaming controller before, but had seen one. They were quite apprehensive about using it. However, on showing them how to, they were soon zipping around the game, thrilled that they were able to master something they had only seen their grandkids play with. Their sense of direction might not have been great, and some of them were not able to find the treasure box, but they had a blast playing the game. And that is exactly what we want, a game they'll enjoy playing so that they keep coming back to it, and the regularity will help strengthen their internal GPS. Let's battle Alzheimer's one turn at a time. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Rashmita. Our next finalist is Olubukola Olatosi. Olubukola completed her master's degree at the University of Lagos in Nigeria. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Oral Biology at the University of Manitoba with her advisor, Dr. Robert Schroth. Her thesis is exploring strategies for implementing a culturally informed caries risk assessment tool used by non-dental primary caregivers for young First Nations and Métis children in Manitoba. The Monte, a 12-year-old boy, made the headline news 
Was it because of his academic excellence or sports accomplishments? No, sadly, the Monte made the headline news because he died as a result of untreated tooth decay. He didn't have to die. You may be wondering, just tooth decay? I'm going to tell you three things about tooth decay in children. Number one, did you know that tooth decay is one of the most prevalent conditions seen in children throughout the world? It's been reported that it is 10 times more prevalent than asthma, but it has received less attention. As I speak, over 500 million children are affected by tooth decay throughout the world. In Canada, the prevalence of tooth decay is as high as 98%, especially among disadvantaged populations, indigenous communities, and among refugees. Number two, when tooth decay is untreated, it can lead to severe complications and poor quality of life. Such complications include, and is not limited to, severe malnutrition, pain, infection, and in rare cases, infection to the brain, which can lead to death. Number three, the good news and the solution is that tooth decay is preventable. And that is why our lab recently developed the Canadian Caries Risk Assessment Tool. This tool is a promising approach to the prevention of tooth decay before the irreversible damage occurs. This tool is designed to assess the risk of a child to develop tooth decay. The beauty of this tool is that it can be used by non-dentists, especially in communities where there is poor access to oral health care, such that no child is left behind and every child deserves to have an opportunity for early dental screening. The aim of my study is to work together with non-dental primary care providers to integrate and implement caries risk assessment into primary care. The goal of my study is to eventually see a reduction in the prevalence and the incidence of tooth decay among Canadian children, especially among indigenous children. The aim of my study is to see an improvement in the access to oral health care. And then we can say, healthy smile, happy child. Every child deserves to have a healthy smile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olubukola. Our third finalist this evening is Daniel Schwed Harujo. Daniel completed his Bachelor of Science at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil. He is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Applied Health Sciences here at the University of Manitoba with his advisor, Dr. Todd Duhamel. His thesis title is Metabolomics, New Biomarkers of Heart Disease in Older Females. If I went to your trash right now, how much would I be able to tell about your life? Probably more than you realize. Your trash tells a story about you, what you buy, what you eat, and how you live. What if I told you that we can apply the same logic to better understand what's going on inside of our bodies? You see, in order for us to stay alive, there are countless chemical reactions happening inside of us at all times. The product of these chemical reactions are small molecules which are called metabolites. Just like trash, these molecules can either be disposed of in the form of waste or recycled and used by our body in other functions. In fact, metabolites could be the key to improving our understanding of how the human body works, but most importantly, about how diseases work. Let's talk about the number one cause of death in the world, heart disease. When it comes to heart disease, early detection and treatment can mean the difference between life and death. If we could use metabolites to develop a new tool that lets us identify heart disease years before it actually manifests, we could be looking at saving countless lives. And this is exactly what I will do with my research. My research is part of the biggest study on women's heart health in the history of our province, with more than 1,000 participants. Women are underrepresented in health research when compared to men, and they also experience symptoms of heart disease differently. On top of that, the current tools that we have to screen for heart disease don't work as well in women as they do in men, meaning that it can often go unnoticed until it is too late. Because of this, the goal of my research is to identify what metabolites are associated with the development of heart disease in women. 
I will do this by analyzing the blood samples of those 1,000 participants to identify what metabolites are present in higher or lower concentrations. I will then follow those participants up for a period of five years so that I can see who develops heart disease and who does not. This will allow me to identify the most important metabolites in the process of developing heart disease, as well as what chemical reactions are involved in this. The knowledge generated from my research will provide the foundation for the development of new methods to diagnose and treat heart disease in women. This is turning trash into treasure. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Our next finalist is Bryn Blakey. Bryn received her Bachelor of Science Honors degree from the University of Manitoba. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy with her advisor, Dr. Michael Garrick. Her thesis title is 100 Billion Times Smaller Than an Atom, Using Electrons to Search for New Physics. Did you know there are hundreds of trillions of particles passing through each and every one of your bodies right this very moment? Now you can't see them, and you certainly cannot feel them. But we know quite a bit about those particles. However, not all intangible things in the universe are understood so clearly. What is dark matter? And why is there nearly five times as much dark matter as the matter we actually can interact with? Now, new information about the nature of matter in our universe usually lurks at the smallest scales. And presently, the smallest resolved distances in science are more than a billion times smaller than the width of a single strand of your hair. So, naturally, we must turn to particle physics experiments, which require some of the largest particle accelerators to study these smallest building blocks that create matter both seen and unseen. As a member of the international collaboration working on the Moeller experiment, I'm searching for new physics processes on these small scales. In this experiment, we use a particle accelerator, which essentially acts as a giant microscope, where we have a sample, magnification and focusing, and the eye. However, unlike a microscope you can set up on a bench top, this experimental setup is 28 meters long, or approximately 17 of me laying across the floor. And that's not even including the racetrack, where we accelerate electrons close to the speed of light. Now we take those accelerated electrons and we scatter them from our target, or sample. And then we use incredibly large, powerful magnets to focus those electrons into the eye of the experiment, the main detector system, and the focus of my research. Unlike some other experiments, we cannot simply purchase these detectors off a shelf in any electronic store. They must be uniquely designed to this specific experiment, which requires a lot of innovative thinking. You see, we're not just building one or two standalone detectors that you could hold in your hands, either. I'm part of a team developing 224 detectors, each of which is specifically required to detect the range of scattered electrons. From the data we collect in this experiment, we will extract the most precise measurement of a key value in our understanding of fundamental physics, and possibly uncover the origins of dark matter. But who knows? On these small scales, we could open up science to a whole new world of discovery. Thank you. Thank you, Bryn. Harshnehi Habergay is our next finalist. Harshnehi completed her master's degree at the University of Peridinia in Sri Lanka. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Food Science at the University of Manitoba with her advisor, Dr. Nandika Bandera. Her thesis title is Sustainable Technologies for Protein Ingredient Development and Functionalization from Canadian Crops. What if I tell you, you can eat as much as processed meat products without being fat or leaning into unhealthy consumption patterns? I am sure you would love it. Not only meat analogs, different other value-added and health-promotive food products can be developed incorporating modified pulse protein ingredients. Pulse proteins are considered as excellent sources of high-quality protein 
which have several advantages over animal protein, including very low caloric value and being outstanding sources of dietary fiber and phytochemicals. In addition, pulse protein production is less resource intensive in, in terms of water and land utilization, which can enhance the environmental sustainability. So, we definitely need to start incorporating more pulse protein into our diet, right? That's where my research comes in. I'm on my way to develop and functionalize protein ingredients from pulses such as lentil, lupin, and hemp. Why did I select these particular pulse crops? Because Canada is the world's largest producer of lentil, and recently there is an increase in trend in lupin and hemp production in Canada. So, in this study, I will extract protein ingredients from these pulses using deep eutectic solvent without using harsh chemicals or organic solvents. Technofunctional properties such as solubility, emulsification, foaming, gelation, fat and water binding capacity, as well as digestibility and bioavailability will be modified by high voltage atmospheric cold plasma processing. High voltage atmospheric cold plasma is a promising green and non-thermal technology which can be used for protein processing. During processing, direct and indirect protein oxidation induce protein-protein cross-linkages and protein fragmentations to backbones of protein and side chains of amino acids. These modifications change technofunctional and nutritional properties of proteins. One of major barriers of utilizing pulse protein ingredients in food, uh, food production is incompatible technofunctional properties and low digestibility and bioavailability. But once this research is completed successfully, we would be able to provide pulse protein ingredients with excellent technofunctional and nutritional properties which can replace animal protein in different value-added and health-promoting food products. As another outcome of this study, we would be able to exploit Canadian pulse protein sources which can enhance the growth of Canadian protein processing industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harshnehi. The sixth finalist is Keshav Alagard Sami. Keshav received his master's degree from the University of Cincinnati. He is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Physiology and Pathophysiology at the University of Manitoba with his advisor, Dr. Sanjeev Dingra. His thesis title is Using Personalized Stem Cell Technology for Heart Regeneration. Do you know the famous celebrity trainer, Bob Harper, from the reality show, The Biggest Loser? Maybe not, but he suffered a massive heart attack despite being young and active. In Canada alone, a population greater than the size of Toronto lives with heart disease and spends over $2 billion every year. A heart attack can happen to anyone, even you. In case you're thinking, I exercise, I maintain a healthy weight, why would I be at risk? Then you would be on the same page as Mr. Harper. During a workout, he suffered a heart attack and was rushed to the hospital where he was diagnosed with a mild heart disorder. Harper is not alone. There are many like him. So, why do we have a heart attack? Studies have shown that an individual with a genetic illness to get a heart disease will greatly suffer from a heart attack. After a heart attack, millions of heart cells are lost, resulting in heart failure. Hearts, unlike other organs, cannot heal itself, which means that they cannot pump enough blood for the normal functioning of our body. This imbalance between the supply and the demand is the crux of heart failure. Currently, existing treatment strategies are only aimed at alleviating the symptoms of heart failure patients. Unfortunately, there is no solution to fix the damaged heart, which is the root cause of this problem. But what if I tell you, after four years into my PhD, I'm now able to generate these personalized beating heart cells in a dish that can be injected to repair your damaged heart. Yes. This was made possible using stem cell technology, and this is my novel solution. In my project, I generated a special kind of stem cell called pluripotent stem cell from patients' blood ethically. These stem cells are the foundation of human life, and they have two remarkable characteristics. First, they can divide like crazy, which means I can take a single cell, and in a week's time, I can make millions of them. Second, 
these cells can be specialized into any cell type in your body, whether it's your brain, your skin, or your heart. So I exploit these properties of stem cells to make patient-specific heart cells. And in order to make these cells more functional and effective for transplantation, I add these safe nanomaterials to them to fix the broken heart. In conclusion, with my research of combining stem cell technology with nanotechnology, regeneration of damaged hearts can now be a reality so that people like Harper, yourself, and me, we do not have to suffer anymore in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Keshav. Our next presenter is Shana Giesbrecht. Shana completed her Bachelor of Science Honors degree at the University of Manitoba. She is a master's student in the Department of Microbiology with her advisor, Dr. Michael Becker. Her thesis title is Quantification of the Prevalence of Sexually Transmitted Bloodborne Infections in Canadian Wastewater Samples. Think of one thing everyone here will do today, regardless of their age, race, gender, or income. My answer is that everybody will use the toilet because my project uses wastewater or raw sewage to track infectious disease. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many regions of Canada began using wastewater testing to monitor for COVID-19. Since clinical testing has slowed down, wastewater testing has become one of our most reliable tools to monitor COVID-19 disease trends. And some rural communities even prevented outbreaks using this information. So how can you track infectious disease using sewage? Well, for certain infections, viral or bacterial particles are shed in urine or stool, and those particles end up in community sewage. We can isolate those particles using tiny filters and extract their genetic material to determine if a particular pathogen was present, and if so, how much was present. Because sewage is communal, the data collected is unbiased, with coverage from every resident. How? Well, because everybody poops. After the success of using wastewater testing for COVID-19, some communities were interested in using wastewater testing for other pathogens too, including sexually transmitted infections, or STIs. My job is to develop wastewater tests for common STIs in Canada. Bacterial STIs like gonorrhea have increased by 400 to 500% over the past decade. This is likely an underestimate, since just like with COVID-19, there are huge gaps in our clinical data. These gaps arise because STIs are asymptomatic in 50 to 70% of people for years or even decades at a time, so many people don't know they're infected. Additionally, geographic and social barriers create inequitable access to healthcare for many Canadians, but especially for those living in Northern Canada, where the rates of STIs are 10 to 20 times the national average. Improved surveillance of STIs is also very important because for women, the first symptom can be severe, including pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, miscarriage, or even cervical cancer. Because people who are asymptomatic or unable to access testing still shed infectious particles in their urine or stool, wastewater testing could help public health identify regions with high rates of STIs. This would allow public health to target healthcare and education resources to the communities that need it. Overall, targeted allocation of resources to affected communities represents an equitable allocation of healthcare resources for all. Just think, the road to more equitable access to healthcare could start with something as simple as a trip to the bathroom. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Akshi Malik is our next finalist. Akshi received her master's degree at Amity University in India. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Physiology and Pathophysiology at the University of Manitoba with her advisor, Dr. Pawan Singhal. Her thesis title is The Protective Role of EMPA in Doxorobicin Induced Heart Failure. Imagine you're on a roller coaster, but without a seat belt. Doesn't sound safe, right? Well, for those of us who know, cancer is the scariest ride of them all. And cancer patients do not have a seat belt to save themselves from what's coming next. Let me explain. Every year, 50,000 Canadians are successfully treated for cancer of the breast, colon, stomach, and many more by an anti-cancer drug called doxorubicin. However, a single dose of doxorubicin 
can damage the heart of one in four cancer patients. And in 11% of the cases, this heart damage can happen even 10 years after the doxorubicin therapy had been stopped. So the scary ride for those cancer patients never truly ends. Countless researchers, including me, work every day to find ways to battle heart failure in cancer patients. Even though extensive research targeted therapies, stem cells and nanoparticles have shown great potential, they're still not at the stage of approval for use in humans. And in the next three minutes, another cancer patient will experience heart failure. So we need to act now and find that seed belt. Or have we already found it? In 2014, a drug called empagliflozin, or EMPA, was approved for the treatment of diabetes. But since then, multiple clinical trials have shown that even though EMPA is for diabetes, also has the potential to improve heart function and reduce cardiovascular deaths. And that is why the US FDA approved the use of EMPA in 2022 for heart failure patients as well. So I asked, can EMPA be that seed belt cancer patients desperately need? Well, my research findings say yes. I found that doxorubicin that usually kills 60% heart cells in just 24 hours, but with EMPA pre-treatment, we can boost cell survival to up to 90% without interfering with the anti-cancer properties of doxorubicin. Rats who were given EMPA a week before doxorubicin had stronger hearts. They maintained their body weight, glucose levels, blood pressure, and overall health. And these novel and exciting findings of my research have contributed to such a strong foundation that we are now ready to move to clinical trials as soon as next year, where we will be able to give EMPA to cancer patients before they go for doxorubicin therapy. And this way, we can not only prevent heart failure in cancer patients, but also make sure that their roller coaster ride is a little easier and much safer. Thank you. Thank you, Akshi. The ninth finalist is Dorsa Jetty. Dorsa received her bachelor's degree from the University of Tehran in Iran. She is a master's student in the Department of Biosystems Engineering at the University of Manitoba with her advisor, Dr. Chingiz Erkenbov. Her thesis title is Revolutionizing Legume Processing for Future Food Security. Imagine, it's the year 2050, you are sitting in your room feeling relieved that doctors were able to cure your cancer with this new advanced medicine. But as you start to feel hungry, you open up your fridge only to find it empty. You check all the grocery store in town, nothing, there is no food. What is going on here? At this point, you see all over the news that back in 2018, scientists warned us that human population would reach 9.7 billion. And now you are in 2050, and now you are facing the consequences. Despite all the advances in medicine and construction, you are facing a trouble with your food, your basic need. But don't worry, there is still hope. As part of my master's studies, I was looking for a food source that has potential to feed this enormous population in the very near future. Well, legumes. But there was one big problem. Legumes are not as popular as meat products, especially in Western societies. But why is that? Why legumes are not popular here? Well, let's be honest. First, they do not taste as good as meat. Second, they take forever to cook, and plus, they have a bit of a reputation for making you feel gassy. But what if I told you my research has come up with solutions for all those mentioned problems? During my studies, I've noticed by adding water to legumes and put them under the infrared light, we can simply do the magic here. I even decided to take x-ray images of legumes to see what was happening inside them after the infrared treatment. And the results were promising. Now I'm proud to say that my research has led to a better tasting, more convenient and digestible food source, which is not only cost effective, but also environmentally friendly. 
The world is changing too fast, and we need to change too to survive. By embracing legumes to our diets and adopting new food processing techniques, we can make a huge difference. So let's work together and pave the way for a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Dorsa. Michelle Morello is our next finalist. Michelle completed her Bachelor of Science Honors degree from the University of Victoria in BC. She is a master's student in the Department of Genetic Counseling at the University of Manitoba with her advisors, Jessica Hartley and Claudia Landry. Her thesis title is Exploring the Integration of Expanded Carrier Screening Within Canadian Fertility Clinics. I want to tell you about a couple who just gave birth to a beautiful baby girl named Sarah. It was their first child and they were beyond thrilled. But after just a couple of weeks, they noticed that Sarah was having some trouble swallowing. Sarah was soon diagnosed with a genetic condition called SMA, which will cause her muscles to become increasingly weak. The couple learns that Sarah will likely never be able to sit up on her own or stand. They are told the SMA is genetic, but they're confused as they have no family history of this. Sarah's parents are what we refer to as a genetic carrier for SMA. We all have two copies of every gene in our body. A genetic carrier is a person who inherits one copy of a faulty gene, but their other copy works normally. So, in, so since they have this backup working copy, genetic carriers often have no symptoms and usually don't even know. But if two people are carriers for the same genetic condition and have a baby together, there's a 25% chance that that baby will be affected. Expanded carrier screening is a genetic test that can be done before pregnancy to provide information on your carrier status. And couples can use this information to make family planning decisions. So why is it that we've all heard of 23andMe but not expanded carrier screening? Well, that's because in Canada, guidelines don't recommend offering or even discussing carrier screening with couples unless they have a specific family history. But like Sarah, most babies born with a genetic condition have no family history. Fertility patients are always being seen prior to pregnancy. So that means fertility healthcare providers would have the most opportunity to discuss expanded carrier screening with their patients. Therefore, I wanted to interview fertility healthcare providers across the country to see what are the current practices and opinions on expanded carrier screening, and why does nobody know that this test exists? I, I found out that providers are not offering this test to all patients. Some are only offering it if a patient brings it up directly or if they're using an egg or sperm donor. And most providers said that they do feel like this test should be something that's offered to all, but they brought up different barriers and challenges they've experienced and listed these as reasons why they don't offer this test routinely. The results of my study will be used to provide recommendations to improve how expanded carrier screening could be offered to all Canadians, empowering families like Sarah's with genetic knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Jared Perron is our next finalist. Jared received his master's degree from the University of Manitoba. He is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Biomedical Engineering with his advisor, Dr. Ji Hyung Ko. His thesis title is Data-Driven Identification of Prodromal Alzheimer's Disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. It's characterized by a progressive decline in cognitive functions to a point that prevents independent living. It's caused by an accumulation of misfolded proteins throughout the brain that have the toxic effect of disrupting connections between brain cells. And that loss of brain tissue is ultimately fatal with an average post-diagnosis survival period of only seven years. The good news is that there do exist new drugs that prevent the accumulation of those misfolded toxic proteins. The catch is that while a dementia diagnosis is a relatively routine clinical activity, an Alzheimer's-specific dementia diagnosis tends to come late in the disease progression where these drugs simply are not effective. They're also very expensive and carry the risk of extremely severe side effects. However, prior to the onset of dementia, there is an intermediate state called mild cognitive impairment. And patients with MCI are at specific risk for developing Alzheimer's because in a three-year period, about 20% will progress to some form of dementia. 
And with that patient group, we saw the opportunity to create a system of early detection for pharmaceutical intervention in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease using a combination of neuroimaging and artificial intelligence. In our model of care, patients at risk for dementia may be screened for MCI by their doctor with a simple questionnaire called a neuropsychological exam. If diagnosed with MCI, they may undergo neuroimaging with PET and MRI. These are safe, reliable, and already established technologies that non-invasively acquire very detailed information about brain structure and brain metabolism. Finally, those images can be input to our AI model, and in consultation with a specialist physician that considers the patient's unique medical history and demographics, we then predict the statistical likelihood that they'll experience further cognitive decline over the next three years. If the patient is at risk for progression to dementia in that period, then proactive measures can be taken. The prescription of protein-busting pharmaceuticals, stimulating social therapies, arrangements for personal care, finalizing legal issues, and consenting to advanced medical directives. By considering the needs of a uniquely vulnerable patient group, we are developing an early warning system for the prediction of cognitive decline in at-risk patients. Our method will ensure that only those who truly require these revolutionary but expensive and potentially dangerous medications would receive them to keep those who don't away from the burden of cost or risk, and all by taking the heart, the commonsensical notion that an ounce of foresight is worth a pound of cure. Thank you, Jared. Well, here we are already. Our last finalist of this evening is Gabrielle Fontaine. Gabrielle completed her master's degree at the University of Manitoba. She is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy with her advisor, Dr. Stephen Pistorius. Now, she is abroad tonight, so she has pre-recorded her presentation. Her thesis title is Safe, Portable, and Low-Cost Breast Cancer Screening for First Nation and Northern Communities. Imagine a world where you could detect breast cancer through the click of a button on your cell phone. In Canada, breast cancer is the most common type of cancer among women. So I think we can all agree that breast cancer screening should be easily accessible to all. But right now, women in First Nation and Northern communities have very little access to medical facilities. And quite often this leads to large palpable tumors once finally discovered and therefore lower survival rates. My research aims to combat these inequities by developing a safe, portable and low cost breast cancer screening system specifically for those in low income and remote areas. Now typically these types of systems reconstruct an image that is interpreted by a doctor for a diagnosis. However, for many remote areas, there is no such doctor. Therefore, not only will this system be affordable, but it will require no trained personnel to operate or obtain the diagnosis. And this is done by combining microwave sensing with artificial intelligence. The current prototype is about the size of a carry-on suitcase. It does not require breast compression and is significantly less expensive than current screening systems. It uses low-powered microwaves, similar to that from your cell phone, to safely scan around the breast. The tissues in the breast may be healthy or potentially cancerous. And these types of tissues differ in their electromagnetic properties meaning that they will reflect and scatter the incoming microwaves differently. And these inherent differences allow for the distinction of healthy versus cancerous tissue. Now, AI, or artificial intelligence, has the ability to learn this distinction. It's similar to when a doctor is looking at an image. They're searching for specific patterns to diagnose the patient. But AI doesn't need an image to form a diagnosis. In fact, AI has the potential to pick up on patterns not seen by the human eye. And by harnessing this technology, 
and applying it to a portable microwave system, breast cancer screening can be easily accessible to all. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Wow, what do you think, everyone? What an incredible group. Thank you again so much to all of our challengers for such impressive presentations this evening. Thank you also to you, the audience, for your support and enthusiasm for graduate student research. Judging panel, please gather in the breakout room for your deliberations. Now, while the judges are deliberating, it is time for the audience, both here in person and uh, watching us virtually, to vote for the People's Choice Award. On your phone or other electronic devices, please go to menti.com. I think you'll see it up there. That's spelled M-E-N-T-I dot com. Once you're there, simply enter the code 9442272. There it is. I'll repeat it one more time. 9442272. After you enter the code, you will see a list of all the finalist names. Click on the name of your choice, then click the submit button, and that's it. You have voted. Now, while the judges are busy deciding the winners, there will be a small reception in the Galleria behind me. We encourage you to exit the Galleria to meet, mix, and mingle with our challengers, and we will reconvene back here after the judges have made their selections. Now, to our virtual audience, there will be a pause while the judges are deliberating. We'll be returning to announce the judges' decisions and the People's Choice Award in about 20 to 30 minutes. Thank you. Wow, a hush fell over the room. <laughs> Well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you to our judges for being with us tonight and for doing the difficult job of choosing the winners among these very impressive competitors. The awards will be presented in the following order. People's Choice, third place, second place, of course, leaving us with first place. Finalists, if your name is called, please come on stage to accept your award. A photographer will take your photo once the awards are presented. I'd now like to invite Dr. Kelly Main, Acting Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, to announce and award your People's Choice recipient, who will be awarded $200. Okay. I feel like I'm at the Oscars. <clears throat> with my glasses fogging with the mask. <clears throat> All right, so I am delighted to announce that the People's Choice Award winner for this evening's three-minute thesis competition is Ola Bacola Olatosi. Congratulations. I'd now like to invite Dr. Diane Hebert Murphy, Provost and Vice President Academic, to announce and award the third place award for $750. This is very exciting. Pleased to announce the third place award goes to Shana Giesbrecht. Now I would like to invite Janet Seeley, President, and Mark O'Reilly, Vice President from the University of Manitoba Retirees Association, 
to announce the University of Manitoba Retirees Association prize for second place for $1,250. The University of Manitoba Retirees Association second prize goes to Akshi Malik. housekeeping here. Okay. I would now like to invite back Dr. Mario Pinto, Vice President, Research and International, to announce the recipient of the Dr. Archie McNichol Prize for first place. The winner will receive $2,500 and will represent the University of Manitoba at the Western Regional Competition on May 25th, 2023 in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Pinto. Thank you. And the Dr. Archie McNichol Prize for first place goes to, are you excited? <laughs> Keshav al -Ghassami. congratulations. Well, while we're at it, let's give another round of applause to all of the finalists and award winners this evening. Congratulations. Now, before we end the evening, I would like to invite back Dr. Kelly Main, Acting Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, to provide a few closing remarks. Thank you very much, Colleen. As Acting Dean for the Faculty of Graduate Studies, I'm delighted to be here to witness the amazing work of our graduate students. I'm in the unique position to see and promote the work of our graduate students and the work that they are doing here at the U of M on a daily basis. I'm thrilled to hear about all of the fantastic work you've presented here. Congratulations to all of the challengers. You should be very proud of your achievements and what you've done today. The graduate students here are an integral part of the university's research program, so thank you for sharing the, your findings and your work with all of us tonight. I would also like to give some thanks to all of the people who helped make this event happen. So thank you first to the technical team of Luke, Josh, Demir, and Adam for ensuring not only the final event tonight, but that the three heats that were held earlier this year were accessible to all of the challengers to compete. Thank you to the volunteers from the Faculty of Graduate Studies, Gail, Rebecca, Andrea, Casey, and Nikki. Your assistance in slide advancement, timekeeping, and room management is greatly appreciated. Thank you to Heather and the team in marketing and communications for their support in the promotion of tonight's event. Special thanks to Judy, who coordinates all things 3MT, including all of us, to get us here tonight, from the rooms, to the judges, to the food, to the tablecloths. Everything is Judy. <laughs> And thank you to the live audience that is here tonight, our first live audience for the finals in several years. And to those of you who are watching online, also thank you for attending. We are very excited to have been able to be back on campus for the in-person final for this 3MT event. But we were also so glad to have the ability to share this virtually with all of those who are watching from somewhere else, wherever you might be. Thank you to the judges as well. Your dedication and support of graduate student research at the University of Manitoba is greatly appreciated. And finally, thanks to Colleen for her second year of superb hosting and pronunciation in all of the challenging titles. 
Uh, thank you again for doing that for us. Congratulations to Kashab, who is now looking, um, who is moving on to the 3MT Western Regional Competition. Best of luck to you. And this officially concludes the 2023 University of Manitoba Three Minute Thesis Competition. Have a great night. Have some more food outside, and please get home safely. Thank you.